Okay, here we go. The title page. In the right spot. Two hundred twenty-two. Oh, I'm not sure who's speaking, but if you could mute yourself, that would be appreciated. Um, so, as I said, Summer Street is a block-long street, runs off of Winter Street. It's a street lined with trees that ends with a wooded dead end, and the Mount Pleasant area of the city runs above that space. So the other nearby streets included Spring Street, St. Paul Street, Wall Street, and Rockland Road. So something to save for another walk. And it was a reasonably short walk into the city over the Wall Street Bridge, the little green bridge. Marcia Colvin paid homage to the area in her book, Weaving the Past into the Present. And she wrote, the 20s saw an improvement in the lifestyle of the Jewish immigrants. Being financially more secure, they moved out of the ghetto in the North End to other parts of the city. Some moved uptown, some west, and others along Paradise Row into an area of the city known as the Valley. Almost every house on Summer Street became a Jewish home. The street was tree-lined, and although modest, all houses contained backyards where children could play. This was a transformation from where they had previously lived. The children in the area went to Winter Street School, a transfer from Dufferin School, where the immigrant children had gone. Now, another source that I have um, is an article written by Edward Barrett, who had lived at 32 Summer Street in the 1930s. And he wrote a newspaper story that was published in the Montreal Gazette and also in the Telegraph Journal in St. John. And he reminisced about life on the street. And he wrote, I was born and brought up on Summer Street in St. John, and if there were any demographers around in those days, they would have told you that our little street was about 50% Jewish and 45% Protestant, give or take a point or two. The other 5% must have been our family, Irish Catholic and Acadian maids at $4 a week and every Thursday afternoon off. The average Jewish and Protestant family consisted of three children, and the average Catholic family consisted of six. In the early 1930s, Summer Street was a pretty cul-de-sac, though I'm sure no one in those days knew the term. It had a paved road, concrete sidewalks, trees, and grass, all underwritten by property owners just before the Depression set in. Neighboring streets might have looked unattractive by comparison. We looked rich, but we weren't just blessed. So this was a home to about 30 families from the 1920s until about the 1960s. By 1965, the only families left were the Cohens at number 80, 82 Summer Street and the Koshetskys who were on Rockland Road. And then the Koshetskys were subsequently displaced by the building of the throughway in the early 1980s. So I've organized this walk that will walk up one side of the street, even side, and then come back down on the odd numbered side. Uh, most of the Jewish homes are still standing. Some of them are showing their age. And the pictures that I'm using came from Google Maps because like I said, I, it's not the best time of year to go and take pictures on Summer Street. There are no leaves on the trees. So I do have an aerial image. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry, I flipped through that too quickly. Um, so an aerial view from Google Maps. So Summer Street is right here where you can see my arrow. Spring Street over here, um, the throughway. Um, Wright Street is here, Celebration Street, Stanley Street, Autumn Street. I'd always wondered if there was an Autumn Street and I guess there is. Um, so this is the, the bird's eye view. And then we'll come down to ground level and we'll come to our first house. And this is the guest family home at number four Summer Street. And it sits on the corner with Winter Street. The Gusses moved into this house in the mid 1920s. And there were Gusses in this house until the mid 1950s when Ida Gus Bransblow, who was the youngest child, moved with the family to Douglas Avenue. So Morris and Celia Gus and their children, Joseph, Ben, William, Abram, and Ida. So we'll start with Morris Gus, who was born in Dorbion, Lithuania, 
and of course was married to Celia. And they came to Canada with their son, Benjamin, in about 1905. And the rest of the family was born in St. John. Morris Gus founded British Iron and Metal in 1905, which collected and sold scrap. And then the business was continued by his son, Abe. For more than 40 years, Morris Guest was the Gabi of the Hever Kadisha, and in recognition of his service of, to the community, he was made the only honorary life member of the board of directors of the congregation. And he died in January of 1949. Don't know a lot about Celia Guest. Um, I'm sure she was a wonder, wonderful mother and grandmother. And Marcia Coven wrote that she gave unselfishly of herself, often making clothing with several other community ladies for those in need. And she did remarry in 1954 after her husband Morris died and she married Samuel Meltzer, who was then living at 560 Main Street. And she lived for about another nine years. She died in August of 1963 at the age of 80. And that, marriage of the Gus and the Meltzer family has had me horribly confused trying to sort families out for a long time, but I'm, I'm getting there. So the oldest child in the family was Ben Gus. We have a picture of him here. So he was born in Dorbion and he was about two or three or four years old when he arrived in St. John. He married Millie Basson in 1938 and they had four children, Karen, Judy, Faith, and Jonathan. And the family later moved to 70 Orange Street. Ben Gus was called to the New Brunswick Bar in 1930, was appointed to Queen's Council in 1952, and then later served as a judge of the probate and family courts in St. John. He also provided legal advice for the city and the province where he was writing and reviewing legislation. He was president of the congregation from 1970 to 1971. He was honored with the State of Israel Bonds Dinner in 1972. And those of, in the group who are musical will remember him as the founder of the New Brunswick Competitive Festival of Music. And I think most of you may have been um, performers in that particular venture. He was also a member of Rotary International for more than about 60 years. And he received an honorary doctorate of civil law from the University of New Brunswick in St. John in 1981. And then he died in January of 1985. I think I have my pictures out of sequence. So I'll just flip forward for a moment. Uh, William Guess um, was an active member of Young Judea and was also involved in the formation of Canadian Young Judea. He was a film distributor first with Regal Films on Princess Street and then was the branch manager for MGM Films in Montreal. He married Rose Shore. Um, they did not have children, and Bill Gus died in September of 1989. I'm just going to go back so you can see Joseph Gus, who was very active as well in Young Judea and in scouting. So he was the leader of the 13th Judean Scouts and involved in scouting at every level within the province. And he was presented with the Scout Medal of Merit by Lord Baden Powell in 1939. He was president of the St. John Young Judea and Maritime Young Judea and a national vice president. He was also involved as a secretary of the Ezra Lodge, um, which was the Zionist group in the city and was an officer for the YMHA, which part may explain why he was so busy with all of that, that he was a part-time staff member at the Telegraph Journal and Evening Times Club in advertising. He married Ruth Berman in May 1938, but he died in 1941 when he was only 31 years of age. And then Abe Gus, he's back over here, um, was also involved with the Boy Scouts and took over the British Iron and Metal Company that had been started by his father. And the business by that time was on Rossay Avenue. He married Bernetta Fransblow and they had five children. Um, Joseph, Janice, Marilyn, Martha, and Debbie. Um, they did live at 85 Summer Street, so at the very top of the hill um, for a period of time in the early 1950s before they moved to Princess Street. And then after that home was destroyed by fire, they moved to the east side of the city. And Abe Gus died in 1985. 
And Bernetta was for the Franswell family that had been in Bathurst, New Brunswick. And she and her brother, Max, both ended up in St. John. Bernetta Gus was a registered nurse. And she had completed her training in 1943 at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, and then came back to work at the St. John General Hospital. And she was also active in the <laughs> Um, and then we have Jack Gus. He must be over here. I guess I forgot to put the picture in of Jack Gus. Sorry about that. Um, but Jack Gus was born in 1916 and died in 1997 in Toronto. He married Jean Takeoff, who was living in Moncton, and they had two daughters, Phyllis and Monica. Um, Jack Gus served during the Second World War in the Canadian Army and was posted to London, England, where he was an ambulance driver and then a clerk. His claim to fame in the Canadian Army was the size of his feet, the largest among all of those who had enlisted, an impressive size 15, so I would think finding shoes at any time would have been quite challenging. And after the war was over, he won a petition to the Canadian government to get pensions for war veterans. He had a scrap metal business in the city, Jack Gus and Company, which was established on Gilbert Street. And he was also on the first Canadian trade mission to Israel in the early 1960s. Um, his other claim to fame, I guess, in the city was that he organized a visit for then Prime Minister John Diefenbaker in the late 1950s. And family lore has it that he was in the Admiral Beatty kitchen preparing the Prime Minister's breakfast. Um, and then finally, Ida Fransblow, um, Ida Gus Fransblow married Max Fransblow in May 1942. They had three children, Jerome, June, and Marlene. And she was most active as the Girl Guide and Brownie leader in the 1940s and 1950s. And one of the stories we have in the museum is that she took the brownies to Fredericton in 1958 for one of the visits by Queen Elizabeth II. Not sure the girls saw very much, but they saw a lot of other people. Um, they lived in the house on Summer Street after Celia Gus remarried, and then later moved to their own home on Douglas Avenue. So when I get around to doing a Douglas Avenue walk, they'll turn up again. Um, and the Franswells, of course, had the grocery store on Main Street North, and then later on Main Street West because of urban redevelopment in the 1960s. A couple of doors away at 14 Summer Street. Um, this was the home for Rabbi and Mrs. Babb from the 1930s until they left the city in 1947. Before they moved into here, there were a couple of years where the city directory listed them as living across the street at number 51. So Rabbi Babb uh, served the community as a teacher and spiritual leader for more than 25 years, beginning in 1921 and he had been ordained as a rabbi in 1920. He came to St. John from Poland as a visitor and was encouraged to stay as the Hebrew teacher. In the years that followed, he taught many children, some of them throughout their entire religious education. He led the weekly Sabbath services and became involved in every aspect of community life, including with leadership roles with the St. John Young Judea and with the Boy Scouts, and also with the Zionist order with the Ezra Lodge. In the 1920s and 30s, he was a port chaplain, and he used his ability to speak as many as 10 different languages to welcome and assist the immigrants who were coming into the city um, to communicate with the officials at the port. He also organized the Maritime Region of the Canadian Jewish Congress and helped set up a Jewish service center in 1944, so during the war, a place for the Jewish service personnel to go. And he served in uniform as, as a flight lieutenant and chaplain in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, the community was sad to see him leave in 1947, but he went on to congregations in Ontario, first in Belleville and then in Peterborough. And uh, the other thing that I really know about this family is his daughter Judith married Morris Selig on the 22nd of March in 1945. And the writing description in the newspaper starts out by saying a marriage of wide interest was solemnized at Synagogue Sherazetic on Sunday afternoon at 
with Miss Judith Babb, daughter of Flight Lieutenant and Mrs. A.M. Babb of Summer Street, became the bride of Morris Harry Selig, son of Mr. and Mrs. Benjamin Selig on Rockland Road. And it goes on to describe how the synagogue was decorated. Uh, there's a notation that Bruce Holder's string quartet played the wedding music. And of course, it described what everybody wore. We'll get into that right now. But um, the bridesmaids were Rosalind Babb, her sister, and Anne Ruth Cohen, who was a cousin of the groom, was the flower girl. The best man was David Selig, um, who was Morris Selig's brother. And the canopy bearers were Isidore Babb, Joe Cohen, Isidore Davis, and Sandy Hoffman. And the ushers were Ralph Isaacs, Jack Levine, A. Babb, Sidney Grossweiner, William Meltzer, and Bernie Goldfeather. Um, the Judith Babb was a graduate of St. John High School and had also trained as a laboratory technologist and was working at the provincial lab at the St. John General Hospital. And um, Morris Selig, before he started his own pharmacy, Selig's Pharmacy on the corner of Princess Street, was working with the Dross the Ross Drug Company. <clears throat> the inter one little interesting note I found is there was a brief mention that Benjamin and Pearl Selick, Morris's parents, had also lived at 14 Summer Street in the late mm -hmm. 1940s and early 1950s mm -hmm. before they moved uptown to Queen Street. So they did have um, four children, Morris, David, Jean, Mary, Helen, and Ida, and Judith. I have to recount that. Um, Benjamin Selig was a sheet metal worker. And um, let's see. And David, their other son, was a petty officer in the Royal Canadian Naval Reserve before he moved to Montreal and worked in sales after the war. And when he was a student at St. John High School, he was a member of the school orchestra as a violin. Just give me one second here. Two. Okay. There. And then Eliezer and Esther Basson also lived in that house in the mid 1940s. And Esther Basson stayed in the house after her husband died um, briefly. And they had come from Poland with two sons and two daughters. And one of their sons, Carl Basson, ran the Basson's dry goods store at the corner of King and Germain Streets. And their daughter, Helen, uh, moved to New York. Our next stop, oops, the Rabbi Bab and then Judith Bab and Morris Selig on their wedding day. And at 20 Summer Street, we have, um, members of the, Gus, of the Stern family, and also Adolf Bramberg, who eventually settled on Leinster Street. But the Stern family members that were living here, Adolf, Gus, and Herman, were all connected to the Stern family that had a farm in South Bay, just west of the city. And these three men were between them. Adolf was the manager, Gus the foreman, and Herman the salesman for the Purity Ice Cream Company. And this building was located at 31 to 33 Summer Street. And then I think later moved down to what we now know as City Road. And the dairy operated through the 1920s until maybe the 50s or 60s. And was one of the first dairies to introduce pasteurized milk to its customers. And um, Adolf Brownberg um, had married into the Stern family. He married Jenny Stern. So he was also involved with the dairy for a short period of time. And he had come to, uh, from Calgary, Alberta, where he had served during the, sec during the First World War as an interpreter for the government and came to St. John in 1918 and was also involved with Crown Beverages and Bluebird be Beverages. And this was the first local company with a license to bottle Coca-Cola. He was also an interpreter during the Second World War. And then after that ended, he settled in St. John on Leinster Street, and he was running the Brown Business Exchange, which was doing buying tax and other business services. 
There's also a brief mention of a Joseph Jacobson, a merchant who had lived in this building in the 1930s. And I'm still trying to sort out the Jacobson family, so I may be able to add more to them later. And we also had members of the Koshetsky family. So Samuel and Lena Koshetsky and their three daughters, Jen, Fanny, and Kay. And later, Morris Koshetsky would also move into this building. So they moved in in the 1930s and stayed through the 1960s. Um, Samuel and Leah Koshetsky also had a son, Israel, and a daughter, Pearl. And three of the daughters were listed in the city directory as residents of the house before they married and moved to other homes. So Samuel Koshetsky um, started out as a peddler in the early 1900s, and he also had a scrap metal business in Sussex. By the 1940s, he had a small kosher butcher shop and grocery store on Main Street, and later a stall in the St. John City Market. His granddaughter, Esther Koshetsky Spector, remembered that Samuel Koshetsky was a man full of life and mischief and was a real character. She also mentioned that he escaped conscription in Russia when he was a young man riding in a hay wagon dressed as a girl. Um, so there must be quite a story there. Um, Leah Koshetsky died in 1944, but she had come from the Budovich family. And she was remembered by her granddaughter as a quiet woman who kept a prayer book on a special table in her kitchen where she could pray. And Samuel and Leah Koshetsky, um, had a brisk dress made for their, for their son, Israel. And that brisk dress is on exhibit in the museum. And their granddaughter, Esther, also remembers that the family held large satyrs in this summer street home. And she remembers that her grandfather, Samuel Koshetsky, whispering in her ear to tell her where he had hid the afikomen. And one year she bartered the afikomen for the promise of a pair of roller skates. And a few days later, he came into the backyard with the roller skates. Uh, Morris Koshetsky um, married twice, I believe. Um, his first, with his first wife, Esther, he had his sons, Hyman and Max, and a daughter, Pearl, who married Abe Holtzman. And they were living on Main Street initially. And when he remarried uh, his second wife, when he married Lily, they moved into 20 Summer Street. And he died in 1965. Um, Lily Koshetsky, the second wife, lived until 1985, and she had been born in Poland and came to Toronto as a young woman in the 1930s and was living near Kensington Market. The family remembered that she always recalled the birthdays of all of the Koshetsky children and brought them storybooks and toys as gifts. She was described as a very friendly person, and she would enjoy riding the Mount Pleasant bus on her frequent visits into the center of the city. And one of her favorite places was the St. John City Market, where she was known and liked by many of the market merchants. So 30 Summer Street uh, was for a period of time the home for Lewis and Lena ba Baxt. But they also lived in this house um, at number 48. So I included their story with this group. And there were a number of different people who lived here over time. So Max Guest lived here in the 1930s, and he was listed in the city directory as a peddler and then as retired before he died in 1945. And his brother Morris lived down the street at number four, and his daughter Ida Guest Tobin, I'll get to in a moment, also lived in this house. Carl Bowson, we've already mentioned his parents, he was boarding here in 1945. And as I mentioned, he was the founder of the Bassins Dry Goods Store on King Street. And his parents lived at number 14. And then the Backs, Lewis and Lena, and their children. Um, Lewis Backs lived to be 90 years old, and he had been born in Melitopol, Russia, and was in St. John before 1910. And he worked as a peddler and scrap metal dealer, and he was also a deaf mute. His wife, Lena, died in 1959, and she had come as well from Dorbyon, came from Dorbyon, Lithuania. Her brother was Abraham Friedman, who lived across the street at number 83. So we will get to him. And they had two sons, 
Jack and Harry, both of whom were boxers, and a daughter who I know only as Mrs. Harry Marcus. So Jacob and Harry Baxt made names for themselves as bodybuilders and weightlifters in the 1920s and 1930s. Jacob died at the young age of 56 on April the 5th, 1956, after a career as a business executive in St. John in Halifax. He may possibly have been working for the Freedmen's. And Harry was listed as the secretary treasurer of A. Friedman and Sons in the city directory in 1950 before he moved on to Toronto. And all I know of the daughter was that she moved to Dorchester, Massachusetts. Now, Joseph and Ida Tobin um, lived in this house from the mid 1940s to the late 1950s before they moved to Fredericton to be closer to their children. So Joseph Tobin was listed in the city directory as an agent with Prudential Insurance in St. John. And Ida Tobin was a member of the Gus family. I believe she was probably the sister of Morris and Max. One son, Herbert, served in the Royal Canadian Naval Reserve during the Second World War as a gunner and able seaman from 1943 to 1945. And when Herbert returned to St. John, he opened tobacco, Tobin's tobacco store on the corner of Union and Dorchester Street. But he died very young. He was only 30 years old when he died in 1955. The other Tobin children, Eleanor, Betty, and Sydney, all moved to Fredericton. And I did a little bit of research and I found in the Fredericton newspapers that Ida Tobin died in November of 1981 and Joseph Tobin in April of 1991. And both of them are buried in the Jewish cemetery in Fredericton. The last family that lived in that house were Samuel and Bessie Rose and they lived here in the 1950s. Samuel Rose was listed in the city directories um, as a store clerk first with Barney's department store. So that was his occupation in 1950 and 1956. And by 1960, he was working at Jack's men's shop. Bessie was the daughter of Alex Sander and Annie Columbus. And her half sister was Rachel Columbus Selby. Um, both of the roses moved to Fredericton where Samuel died in 1976 and Bessie in 1989. And based on what I could find in the obituaries, it does not appear that the Roses had children. So 50 Summer Street um, had a listing in the 1940s and 1950s as the home of Samuel and Sarah Essing. So I looked in my notes and Samuel Essing was the owner of Essing's Clothing House at 161 Union Street in 1945 and was owner of the Peter Pan dress shop in the 1950s and 1960s, which was at 413 Main Street. It appeared that he died in November of 1988 and is buried in the Jewish cemetery in Vaughan, Ontario. And Sarah was buried in Dollard des Ormeaux when she died in 1988. So she was buried near Montreal. That's all I know about the Essings. So I'm hoping that, I know I've heard the name mentioned in some of our other discussions. So I'm hoping somebody can add a bit to that story. At 62 Summer Street, I don't have a picture of the house because the house is no longer standing, but this was the home of Israel Goldberg um, and Esther Goldberg. Um, so they were listed here as being residents in the 1930-1931 city directory. Israel Goldberg was an immigrant from Lithuania to St. John, and he established a junk business on Lombard Street. So um, just to refresh your geography, this was a street that ran from Paradise Row towards the harbor. He was married to Esther and they had four children, Isaac, Hyman, and two daughters known to me as Mrs. Simon and Mrs. Jacobson. Israel Goldberg died in 1933 and Esther in 1936. Isaac Goldberg stayed in the house um, until at least 1950. And his occupation was listed as a metal broker and he was employed with industrial supplies by 1950. So 70 to 72 Summer Street was the home for the Hoffmans and the Sandlers. So Benjamin and Rose Hoffman um, lived here from the 1920s to the 1940s. 
Ben Hoffman um, was the brother of Meyer Hoffman, um, who was the tailor on Main Street. And there were two sisters, Minnie and Sarah. So this family came from a little place called Tinkovitz, which was a small village near Minsk, Poland. Um, I know well, those were his sisters. So they, Ben and Rose Hoffman had children. So Drs. Martin and Dr. Alexander or Sandy Hoffman and a daughter, Merle Harris. Um, and Ben Hoffman worked with his brother Meyer at the tailor shop on Main Street before he opened his own clothing store at 335 Main Street. And this was the location later taken over by Eddie and Ermini Cohen and became a ladies dress shop. And Ben Hoffman died in 1948. So their children, um, particularly their sons became quite prominent. Um, so Martin Hoffman, uh, graduated from St. John High School, from Mount Allison University, and then Dalhousie, and then McGill University. And while he was studying in Halifax, he was working under Dr. Frederick Banting, who uh, was the co-discoverer of insulin. And Dr. Hoffman received a scholarship from the Banting Research Foundation at the University of Toronto in 1940 to study the biochemistry of sex hormones. He then continued studies in experimental medicine at McGill. And in the 1950s, he was at Dalhousie University and then went on to the, Vic and the Victoria General Hospital. And then he moved on to Montreal in 1952 to teach at McGill, where he was the Associate Professor of Medicine and later the Director of the Gerontology Unit at the Allen Memorial Institute. And he was conducting diabetes research um, in various laboratories. He was also the physician in chief at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal and was also had um, medical privileges in Brooklyn, New York at the Methodist Hospital. Um, he later, his final moves are between Montreal and New York and St. John and Halifax. At the end of his life, he settled in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he established a medical undergraduate program. And Alexander Hoffman um, graduated from St. John High School, Mount Allison and Dalhousie, and then the Tufts School of Dentistry in Detroit. And he had a practice in the Department of Dentistry and Oral Surgery at the Victoria General Hospital and was an associate professor in the Faculty of Den Dentistry at Dalhousie University. And their sister, Merle Hoffman Harris, moved to Montreal. Um, Ben's brother Morris also lived in the house and was a tailor, and he later moved to Fredericton. So I wanted to add, come back to this story I found um, in the Telegraph Journal that was written by Edward Barrett of growing up on Summer Street in the 1930s, and he has a recollection of the Hoffman family. And he wrote, Mrs. Hoffman was warm, caring, kind, intelligent, emotional, witty, and with a warm European accent. Her great mission in life, it seemed to me, was to put fat on my skinny frame. Oi, Nedela, if only I had you for a couple of months, I'd fatten you up. I secretly wished she would kidnap me and hold me prisoner, enchanted by nothing more than the glorious smells coming from her kitchen. I wouldn't press charges. Mrs. Hoffman's veranda was a magnet for other members, other mothers on the street, and they seemed drawn there with cramps and go-karts every sunny afternoon. There were always bananas or grapes or tangerines or watermelon or pretzels. Her son Mendel was the prize of Summer Street, going as he did from scholarship to scholarship. Everyone knew he was destined for great things. Mendel was older than most kids on the street. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure he ever was a kid. He was a scientist. We knew because he had a laboratory in his cellar. And the only place other kids had seen a laboratory was in horror movies. One day, word swept Summer Street that Mendel was going to boil a cat, a dead cat, of course, boil it in Mrs. Hoffman's kosher kitchen. The mothers with baby carriages converged even earlier that day at the Hoffman veranda and were greeted with the usual warmth. Every woman obviously wanted to know whether it was true about the cat, but there were no direct questions, just subtle inquiries about Mendel's health and how he was doing these days. A kind of tension grew and Mrs. Hoffman, feeling it was time to clear the air, 
lifted her ample self from the veranda swing, and moved to her porch where she rang the upstairs doorbell. When the buzzer sounded, she opened the door and shouted to her son, Mandela, don't forget the garlic. The peals of laughter behind her signaled absolution. So you can just imagine this kind of experience. And here's the Hoffman family here. The other residents of that house were Nathan and Sophie Sandler, who lived here in the 1950s and 1960s. Nathaniel Sandler was born in New York in 1914 and died in Halifax in 1973. He was married to Sophie Zatzman and they had four children, Philip, Ron, Stephanie, and Sheila. And there was another baby as well that died at birth. The family lived on Summer Street before they moved to Halifax in 1964. In the 1950s, Nathan Sandler was a salesman for McCormick and Zatzman, and then later was listed as the owner of the community market, a small grocery store on City Road, and then later on Prince Edward Street. He served in the Royal Canadian Navy as a petty officer during the Second World War. And when he died, he was buried in Halifax, and his wife Sophie is buried in Toronto. Seventy four Summer Street. Um, this was the home for Max and Ida Grossweiner. And they were living here by 1930. Max Grossweiner died in 1949. And he and Ida had um, four children, Sydney, their son, and three daughters, Dora, Rose, and Esther. And he was a ladies' tailor from the 1910s to the 1930s and later had a ladies' clothing store. Ida Grossweiner came from, uh, from the Rubin family. Her parents were Nathan and Dora Rubin. Um, and there was a note in Marcia Coven's book that she was known to give unselfishly of herself. So I was working with some of the other ladies, including Mrs. Cecilia Gust, um, making clothes for those in need. Um, I did find one little newspaper notice in the store in, in 1928 on the 23rd of August. And the story is quite short. Uh, it reads, a two-story dwelling, 74 to 76 Summer Street, owned by Max Grossweiner and occupied by himself, his family, and Morris Margolian was badly damaged by fire, as was an adjoining woodshed on Wednesday afternoon. Kitchen, dining room, closets, and a small bedroom were burned. Also the upper story of the woodshed. But they were able to repair and stay in the house. For a brief period of time, it seems that Jack Kelp and Celia Kelp also lived in this house and they were of course members of the Kelp family. Um, Jack Kelp came to St. John at the age of 14 in 1926 and he came with his mother, Sarah, his brother, Abe Kelp, his sister, Celia, and sister-in-law, Fina. And Jack Kelp would later marry Teresa Ross and they had two sons, Mark and Norman. And he later had his own store, Jack Kelp's Men's Shop, on King Street and then on Charlotte Street. And they moved to, I'm going to say Fifth Street. Um, so when, when I get around to doing a Fifth Street walk, they'll turn up again. And Celia Kelp had, of course, come with them. And she worked as the buyer for Abe Kelp's store. But they were only in the house for a very short period of time. So this was the only picture I could find. Um, so this is Ida Grossweiner in the cottage in Pamdenac. We're almost at the top of the first of the hill at 80 to 82 Summer Street, which was the home for the Cohen family, uh, Meyer and Bessie Cohen. Their three children, Jenny, Edgar, and Israel. And then for Brief periods of time, Jacob Lampert, the Hamburg family. And then um, as Norman Hamburg tells me, they were put out because when Jenny Cohen married Ben Cohen, they needed the lower flat for them to move into. And the Hamburgs ended up on Paddock Street. Um, so the Cohen family were one of the early families to move to the street in the 1920s. And the Cohen family were also the last Jewish family on Summer Street. Um, so Meyer Cohen is credited with having the trees planted along the street. 
He was also very active politically with the Progressive Conservative Party and was involved, of course, with the congregation and supported himself in the real estate business. He also organized the immigration of other family members from Minsk, Russia. And uh, he died in 1963. Bessie Cohen was also the daughter of immigrants, um, Louis and Elizabeth Levine. And she had four brothers, Abe, Isaac, Simon, and Nathan, and two sisters, Nellie and Lillian. And her sister Lillian Koshetsky turns up on the other side of the street. Um, Bessie Cohen was a member of the Dasawiso and of Sisterhood. So their sons um, um, we'll move on to. So Israel Cohen um, was had two wives at separate times, of course. Um, his first wife, Lillian, and with her, he had their two sons, Morton and Warren. And then he remarried to Teresa. And Israel Cohen worked as a clerk in the Dominion Food Shop and then was a part owner of Harry's Men's and Boys Shop on Union Street before he went on to open the Hillside Grocery on Somerset Street. And he died in 1993. And Edward Barrett's newspaper story includes a story about um, his friend, Izzy Cohen. And Edward Barrett writes, ecumenism, ecumenism was a long way from entering our vocabularies when my oldest brother, Bill, then known as Billy, made the Stations of the Cross in Holy Trinity Church with his good friend, Izzy Cohen. <coughs> my mother had called to Billy as he played on the street with Izzy and ordered him off to church to observe the solid morning, solemn morning on Good Friday. Billy balked, but Izzy, good pal that he was, volunteered to go along. The first indication that not all might go well was Izzy's reluctance to dampen himself with holy water and his stumbling attempts at genuflection. But that was not the real problem. The real problem was getting Izzy to take off his hat, a vivid red and white toque. We don't take our hats off in shul, protested Izzy, so why should I take it off here? A whispered but heated debate followed and my brother relented. The sight of two little boys making the way of the cross was not extraordinary, but one of them wearing a toque and looking very non-Irish was most unusual. I don't know whether there was laughter in paradise, but I do know there was laughter in my mother's voice when she got on the telephone to Mrs. Hoffman up the street and told her of Billy's latest adventure. Edgar Cohen married Ermine Bernstein in 1948 and they lived for a short time in Sydney, Nova Scotia before returning to St. John. And for more than 50 years, Eddie and Ermini were the owners of Hoffman's on Main Street in the north end of the city where they were selling ladies fashions. And they had three children, Kathy, Shelley, and Lee. And Eddie Cullen was also involved in a number of local organizations, including the PC Association of Canada. Danny Cullen, the daughter in the family lived in this house for almost her entire life. She lived a quiet life at home as a daughter and then as a homemaker. She married Benjamin Cohen in 1949 and they had one daughter, Lori. And Jenny is one of, I think, three or four centenarians in the Jewish community. When she died in 2016, she was 101 years old. And her husband, Ben Cohen, uh, had been born in Bath, New Brunswick. Um, his parents were Aaron and Lena Cohen, and he had four sisters, Sari, Sarah, Jenny, Leba, and Minna. And he moved into the house and there he stayed. Um, ben served for many years on the board of the congregation. He was the first treasurer of the St. John Jewish Museum. And he was also active in helping to lead the weekly Sabbath services after the departure of the last rabbi. He had started his working career managing his late father's dry goods store, but that I understand wasn't quite to his liking. So he became a bookkeeper and office manager for several of the Jewish businesses around the city and worked almost up until the time of his death in 1999. Jacob Lampert lived in the building as a boarder in the 1930s. All I know of him is that he was listed in the city directory as a peddler. And Phil and Bella Hamburg rented the downstairs flat. And as I mentioned, move, had to move out in 1949 and then moved to Paddock Street. So Philip Hamburg had come from Cape Breton. Um, and he 
came to St. John when he married Val Dreskin, and they arrived in the city in 1944 and ultimately took over Dreskin's ladies wear, which had been started by Val Hamburg's father, Abe Dreskin. And they had three sons, David, Norman, and Harvey. Um, and Val Hamburg was the oldest of the Dreskin children. Her brothers were Oscar and Nathan. And um, she was very hands-on with her father's um, ladies wear store, first on Dock Street and then on Union Street. And Phil Hamburg's father, Lewis, also joined the family after his wife died. Um, the more, so that's 80 to 82. The pictures of the Cohen family. And at 85 Summer Street, um, Morris Lampert was living here in the 1930s. And he was listed as a peddler and a junk dealer. And Abe and Bernetta Gus lived in this house sometime before 1950 and then moved on to Princess Street. And we've already talked about them. So, um, and as you can see, we've crossed the street. We're now coming down the odd numbered side. And we're going to stop at the Friedman House at number 83 and the home of Jack and Rose Friedman. And they, as well, they were among those early Jewish families to settle on Summer Street. So from the early 1950s until the early 1920s until the mid 1950s. And then they moved to a new suburban development in Quinton Heights in West St. John. And it was the same neighborhood where three of their four children had settled. So Jack Friedman was the oldest child of Abraham and Mary Friedman. And his two brothers were Ben and Rube, and he had two sisters. Ida, Mrs. Ben Goldstein, and Anne, Mrs. Harry Holtzman. So three of the four siblings also lived on Summer Street for short periods of time. So Jack Friedman had come to St. John from Dorbian, Lithuania with his mother in 1905. He married Rose Selick of Hillsborough, New Brunswick in 1923. And they had four children of their own, two sons, Louis and Bernie, and two daughters, Marcia and Edith. Jack Friedman went into business with his father in 1918, and his father had founded Eastern Iron and Metal Company, and this was eventually renamed as A. Friedman and Sons. Jack Friedman was the past president and board chairman of the Canadian Secondary Metals Association, and he provided advice to the Canadian government on metal salvage during the Second World War. In the community, he turned out to be the youngest president of the congregation Sherazetic when he was elected in 1929. He was able to bridge the linguistic gap between the Yiddish speaking immigrants who, so of his parents' generation and the English speakers of his generation. He was active in fundraising for the State of Israel bonds and was also a member of the Kiwanis Club where he was the Lieutenant Governor. Um, he died on Thursday, September the 5th, 1963, at the age of 63. And Rose Friedman was born in Hillsborough in 1904, and died in 1996 at the age of 92. She was very active in the community, so she was at various times president of the Sisterhood and of the Shomers Club, a seniors organization which she also founded. She was active alongside her husband with the State of Israel Bond Drives and with Hadassah Witzo. And she also volunteered for organizations, including the Red Cross, Big Sisters, Meals on Wheels, um, Chauffeured Children to a school for children with cerebral palsy. And she also helped organize um, shelter for immigrant families that were fleeing from the Hungarian Revolution in the 1950s. Their oldest son, Louis, um, graduated from St. John High and Dalhousie University. And then he came back to St. John and practiced as a family doctor for more than 40 years. He married Eda Bernstein in 1948. And he met her when she came from Montreal to visit her university friend, Ethel Garson Miller. Um, Dr. Friedman was chief of family medicine at the St. John Regional Hospital and was later a consultant for occupational health. Um, let's see, his children were Marianne, John, and Robert. And 
He moved to Toronto later in life. Bernie Friedman um, graduated from St. John High, started out working in his father's scrap metal business. And then after the scrap metal business was closed, he opened Bernard Friedman Insurance in the late 1960s. He married Natalie and they had three children, Richard, Michael and Cheryl. And in retirement, he moved to Toronto to be closer to his children. Marcia Coven um, married Jerry Coven in 1948. And they had four children, Diane, Charlotte, Andrew and Sherry. And after graduating from St. John High School, she trained as a nurse at the St. John General Hospital. And then she returned to the University of New Brunswick in St. John as a mature student to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. And she was active in the Sisterhood and in DASA and at various times was president of both of them. She was also a member of the Shomer Club that her mother had established and chaired the Hebra Kadisha. And as we all know, her biggest accomplishment was the founding of the Jewish Museum in July of 1986. And without her, um, we wouldn't be gathering together here this afternoon. The youngest child is Edith Friedman Steinberg. She married Dr. Barry Steinberg in December of 1959. She also trained as a nurse, but she did her training at the Jewish Hospital in Brooklyn. And her husband, Barry Steinberg, completed his medical training at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And they later moved to Massachusetts and had their own two sons, Adam and Jack. And it was quite an interesting write up of the wedding in the newspaper. Um, and then Jack's brother, Ben Friedman, also lived in this house. Um, he was married twice. He married um, Norma first, and they had two children, Melvin and Ellen. They became Ellen Hochberger. And then he remarried to Naomi Elman. He worked alongside his father and brother Jack at A. Friedman and Sons, and had served as secretary of the congregation board. So at 81 Summer Street, um, we had Israel and Bessie Jacobson, and then Barnett and Doris Jacobson. So Israel Jacobson um, was listed in the city directories as a junk dealer, and his wife remained in the house as a widow um, from the time he died in 1930 until the, she was saved in the house until the late 1940s. And Barnett and Doris Jacobson were also listed as residents here in 1950. Um, they were the parents of Marcia and Mary Ellen, and Barnett Jacobson was a salesman. He had a variety of sales offices in the city and they represented a wide number of brands. And Israel and Ada Koshetsky also called this building home. Israel Koshetsky um, was the son of Samuel Koshetsky and married Ada Jacobson. And their two children were Irwin and Esther who became Esther Spector. And Israel Koshetsky ran a co kosher grocery store on Main Street. Um, so Israel and Ada Koshetsky moved to Montreal in the 1960s to be closer to their children. And both of them are buried in the Baron de Hirsch Cemetery in Montreal. Um, their son, Erwin, has also since passed away. Um, Esther is still alive and she had trained as, and practiced as a clinical psychologist. 79 Summer Street was the home of Abraham and Mary Friedman from the 1920s until they died in the 1940s. So just two doors away from their son, Jack. And Abraham Friedman was among the first immigrants to come to St. John from Dorbion, Lithuania. He arrived here in 1899. And five years later, his wife, Mary and son, Jack came into the city. And he also brought over his father, Marcus Friedman. Abraham and Mary Friedman had four more children, Ben, Rube, Ida, and Anne. And Abraham Friedman was also the brother of Lena Baxt, who we've already talked about. Abraham Friedman was the founder and first president of A. Friedman Sons and Limit, A. A Friedman and Sons. And they had the scrap metal business and it was located on Long Wharf. Um, so two of the two daughters in the family also lived in this house in the early part, the early years of their married lives. So Anne married Harry Holtzman 
and they lived in this house in the late 1940s before they moved to King Street East. And Norman Hamburg remembers, was across the street at number 80, remembers playing outside with Norman Holtzman when they were very young. And one anecdote involved Norman Holtzman falling from a tree that he had climbed and breaking his arm. And I think Norman Hamburg was frightened by that and actually ran home rather than running to get help. Um, and Harry Holtzman, of course, was involved with the Sunray Fruit Store where he was a partner with his brother, Mo. And then Harry went out on his own to take up Holtzman's furniture and appliances. So they were the first um, store to sell televisions in St. John and they expanded into furniture. And Harry's son, Norman, joined him in the business um, in the 1960s. Harry Holtzman was also well known as a baseball player. Um, and the Goldsteins also lived in this house until they moved to Leinster Street. Um, and Ben Goldstein made a name for himself um, as a musician initially, playing in dance bands, but was later the owner of Ben Goldstein's Music Center on um, Charlotte Street and then Union Street or Union and then Charlotte, I forget which way it goes, uh, where he sold sheet, sheet music, instruments and records to several generations of customers. So Abraham and Mary Friedman. And then the Goldsteins and the Holtzmans. And 61 Summer Street was the home of Hyman and Lillian Kaszewski. And they later moved to 91 Cranston Avenue. So Hyman Kaszewski was born in St. John in 1907 and died in 1993. So his parents were Morris and Esther Kaszewski across the street. His brother, Max, um, who lived on Rockland Road and was uh, with his wife and children there. And they also had a sister, um, Pearl, who married Abe Holtzman. So Hyman Koshetsky married Lillian Levine. They did not have children. Um, Hyman Koshetsky was involved in the antique business. So he owned the antique center on King Street. And he also worked um, the antique business in Prince Edward Island. And in his youth, he was a boxer in the lightweight division. And Lillian Koshetsky was the daughter of Lewis and Elizabeth Levine. So her sister, Bessie Cohen, lived across the street at number 82 um, with her husband, Meyer. So lots of family connections. At 55 Summer Street, we have Samuel and Bessie Rapkin. So they were living here by 1930. And at that time he was listed in the city directory as a hay merchant with a stand at Haymarket Square. And he retired from that in 1939. Um, they had four sons, including Jack, who owned the premium meat market, Eli, Harvey, and Harry. And there was one daughter, Bessie, who married Morton Pikowski, and she was living on King Street East. Um, I do have an oral interview in the collection with three of the sons, Eli, Jack, and Harvey. Uh, it's one of those things that someday I will transcribe it, but there's going to be a bit of a challenge sorting out who is saying what and there are a few spots in the recording where the brothers are actually speaking over each other. So you can appreciate that might be a bit of a challenge. At 51 Summer Street, we had the Taxer family. And before he moved across the street to number 14, Rabbi Bab also lived in this building. You can see from the picture that has definitely seen some better days at the time that this image was captured by Google. So Hyman and Fanny Taxer lived here from the 1920s to the early 1950s, so another one of those early families. Hyman Taxer was a peddler and a junk dealer, and when he died in 1972, he was living in a nursing home in Halifax. And uh, Fanny Taxer, was a member of the Zatzman family. So her parents were Max and Ethel Zatzman and her brothers were Jacob, Lewis and Morris. And she had two sisters, um, Annie and the other one who I only know as Mrs. Joseph Wanneman. Um, so I'm still kind of sorting out the names of the children because there were all kinds of 
taxers, and I'm not quite sure how they all connect together. Um, but the names I've run across include Al, Jack, Ann, Rose, Ethel, and Ruth. I know that Al played on the YMHA basketball team, and he was listed in the 1935 city directory as a mechanic. I know that Ann was a track and field athlete, and that Ethel was listed in the city directory in 1935 as, as a stenographer at McCormick and Zatzman. And the same year, Rose was listed as a milliner, a, a hat maker. And that Ruth married Charles Zatzman and they had three children, Ken, Gary, and Janice. And I know that Ruth and Charles Zatzman later moved on to Douglas Avenue. Um, so I'm a little confused on the taxers, but I'm sure we can sort all of them out. And our last stop um, is here at number 13. And not a very exciting slide. Um, the house is no longer standing, so no picture of the house. And Abram Garson lived here for a brief time from the mid 1920s to the early 1930s. And he had come to St. John from Dorbion, Lithuania. Um, he was the son of Frank and Ethel Garson and he had two brothers, including um, one was Hyman Garson and the other was listed as um, the initial B and a sister who became Bertha Alperstein. He came um, to Canada with his wife, Bertha, and they have four daughters, um, Frida, April, Helen Carroll, Rose Tobin, and Ethel Myers. And Abram Garson was the president of the Garson Odeon Theatres and as well owned a number of city apartment buildings. And in the early 1960s, he devoted the theater seats in the synagogue um, that were in the synagogue on Carlton Street and which have subsequently been moved to this building. And those seats were donated in memory of his wife. I think that was our last stop. Um, so just a quick acknowledgement to my son, David, who uploaded the images from Google Maps for me. To make that a little bit easier. Oops. So I would like to thank you for coming on this virtual walk. I'm really hoping that when I stop sharing my screen that you'll share your comments, corrections, suggestions, memories, things I've left out, people I may have missed. Um, so that the next time I do this presentation, which will be in June, it will um, have a little bit more to it and maybe sort it out a little bit more from that point. And I think that was my last slide. And this was the last in our series of walks. Um, I'm hoping that within the next couple of weeks, I'll start having the recordings available for people to watch. Um, my video editor is a little bit preoccupied at the moment, but once I can mm -hmm. adjust things, I'm hoping to have those up and running for you. So I'm going to, at this point, um, stop sharing my screen so we can all come back.